My name is Trey Mangum and this is Shadow and Axe Opening Act. Each week we sit down with some of your favorite black creatives in Hollywood to discuss how they made it in the entertainment industry. This week we are talking to the one and only Erica Alexander. She is always booked and busy. She has appeared in projects recently such as Wu-Tang and American Saga and Run the World. She's also busy producing under her production banner, Color Farm Media. And through Color Farm, she's produced projects such as John Lewis, Good Trouble, among many other things. We asked Erica to tell us about the moment that she knew as an actress, she wanted to do more things behind the scenes, such as producing and conceptualizing projects. That moment when she realized she wanted to do more than just be an on-screen talent. Okay, I have to tell you a little bit of my origin story, I guess, to answer <laughs> that question. Um, I was actually discovered at New Freedom Theater, New Freedom Theater, Philadelphia. Um, I'm not from Philadelphia, I had moved there. Um, just recently, when I was 14 years of age, I was discovered mm -hmm. at um, New Freedom Theater because I was in a summer program and it was the fifth week of a six week pro summer program that a Merchant Ivory film came to town and they were wanting to cast black girls for this role in a independent film. And when the smoke cleared and hundreds of girls auditioned, they had chosen me. And that gave me my beginning onto and into the world of film and television and stage. Um, and so I got lucky. I got, I was one of those people who was picked out of the street, like I'm what they call a natural. I didn't take any classes other than that. Um, after that, I just kept working and those were my classes being in a professional space and learning from people who I admired, who were kind enough and patient enough to see that I was a newbie. And then also by shutting up and just doing what was in front of me. Um, so that's the story of my career is one of being self-taught, self-motivated, self-propelled. And so that had something to do with also why I started to create within that space because I saw very quickly that for a young black girl who looked like me, dark skin, nappy hair, that there were very few, few roles that I could play. Um, there were no ingenue roles for black girls, mm -hmm. none. Um, when I started, there wasn't even Nia Long yet <clears throat> or Jada Pinkett <laughs> or uh, any of those people, certainly no Halle Berry. Um, and those were the types of roles that they would get eventually. They would sort of fill out that ingenue space Ingenue is the word for a uh, woman, or I should say young woman, damsel in distress <laughs> type things. Um, I think that the daytime, the daytime Emmys had a category. I think that that was their that was their younger performer. I think before they changed it to <laughs> younger actress. Um, that's that's when it, when people say Ingenue, I always think of wow, that was that was the the category like in the in the eighties. <laughs> That's right. And, and you know what? I that's, that You're the first person to ever bring that up. So yes, in particular, that was it. And in my point, in, in my uh, world, you could play roles as a young person, but they were usually foster children, prostitutes, or slaves. And I played those roles in that order wow. <laughs> when I first started. Those were the first roles I played. Uh, I was a prostitute on Law and Order. I was a foster child in um, my, my Little Girl, the, the film that found and discovered me. And then after that, I was in uh, George Washington, The Forging of a Nation. I played Ona Judge, um, Martha mm -hmm. Washington's slave. Mm -hmm. So there you go. <laughs> and um, and so you, you went, by the time I got the Cosby show and he, I got that role because his wife saw me off Broadway and with her best friend, Gloria Foster. And um, I, the story goes that she told Bill Cosby about me and wanted him to see the play with Gloria. I don't think he ever saw the play, but he created this role for me. I got a call one day to come to his house and he created the role of Cousin Pam for me. And then I was off on um, my, um, in particular, comedic um, TV sort of, of, of career. But mm -hmm. up until that point, I was just purely independent film stage. I'd already traveled with the Royal Shakespeare Theater and and are gone around the world with uh, Peter Brook and his Mahabharata. I'd been in um, off-Broadway plays, last play with um, Joseph Papp, who was the founder of the Public Theater, was the play I'm talking about with Gloria Foster. And um, it was called, um, um, Lord, whatever it was called, I forgot. <laughs> <laughs> and, but that play was important because that's the play that Camille Cosby saw 
that got me the job on, on the Cosby show and eventually got me in, in into a world where I probably was taken more seriously and he eventually got the role of Max seeing Shaw for Living Single. So mm -hmm. there you go. And when I got to Cosby show, this is what I meant to say, the play was called Forbidden City. It was Bill Gunn's last play before he passed away, really oh. fantastic African-American writer. Mm -hmm. When I got to the Cosby show, I saw that the creators had all the control. And if, if I was going to be a young woman with very few choices about what I'd play, I'd have to become a creator. And I had never seen that that was what I have to do so clearly. Um, in television, unlike film, film you hardly ever saw the writer. You saw only the producer and the casting director and the director. But in mm -hmm. TV, the writers run it. They are the executive producers, they run it, they control the set, and they have the written word, and they're changing it right on the spot. So I thought, oh, I'll learn, I teach myself how to write. Well, that's easier said than done, Trey, because <laughs> it took me years and years to figure out how to do it because it's a craft. And although I might have had a natural talent for acting, I didn't necessarily have a natural talent for writing. I didn't know to discipline myself to sit down in a chair, but I eventually married one of the top African-American writers. Um, he was the first African-American writer that wrote a movie that made over $100 million. He wrote Eraser. His name is Tony Perrier. And he taught me, he said, Erica, you need to sit your butt in that chair. And that is it. He says, writing is writing and rewriting. And eventually I got there. So that's how I got into that space because I saw that there was a deficit. I saw that it was blocking me and I saw that I'd have to learn a new skill set or I thought I'd have to learn a new skill set in order to change my future. Yeah. Yeah. And then speaking in that similar vein, what is the objective and goal in this space that you hope that Color Farm Media is able to carve out with your upcoming projects? You know, congratulations on the recent um, acclaim um, of Good Trouble, um, the John Lewis documentary. So, so great. Um, so what, tell us about what your goal is ultimately for Color Farm Media and the projects that you all put out. Thank you so much. Uh John Lewis, Good Trouble was our first film. It just got nominated for three Emmys. It won Best um, Documentary for NAACP. Mm -hmm. And our director, Don Porter, and one of our producing partners, Laura McAchilson, Chisholm, we are, um, and my partner, Ben Arnon, we are thrilled about its success in the wider world. But my background on that was, in, and on Color Farm, was I was very much into being an activist and an advocate um, for women and girls. And um, inside of politics, that comes from my background, the fact that my mother and father were both orphans and I spent the first 11 years of my life in a hotel called Starlight off of Route 66 in Flagstaff, Arizona. And I learned through them that having to depend on the kindness of strangers <laughs> was a bit mm -hmm. difficult in the world where you make social contracts with each other, to take care of each other, to look out for each other. And I started looking for better ways to do that, especially after my father passed away. And um, I started to help my mother take on some of the responsibility of, of, of contributing to the family unit. And um, I got into politics. And one of the first people that I ever backed was Hillary Clinton. And um, I met amazing black women uh, campaigning for her first run as president. I was always interested in her career because she was a person, and I, by the way, I, I also went to the Philadelphia High School for Girls. So I had a very female-centric point of view in mm -hmm. life. And I liked strong women because I thought that the strongest women weren't ever supported properly. In fact, people make them into wicked witches. They make them into evil. They make them into all sorts of things. And I was not having it. I was like, <laughs> no, those are the people who need the most help. Your grandmamas and aunties and people you think are so strong, we need to help them first. We need to make sure that they're okay. Because just because they're doing all of that doesn't mean that they don't need help. And in fact, they do. Mm -hmm. They're just having to do it and they don't maybe believe that they can ask for it or if they do ask for it they're disappointed so i wanted to be a person that came up for strong women and when i did i met Maya angelou and i met cecily tyson and i met um just amazing uh women and men and they started to teach me about the greater conversation around um civil rights criminal justice um workers rights uh, human rights all these things that we're all going to interconnect and create a platform that wouldn't only 
build out and expand my knowledge of self and my human sort of um, responsibilities as mm -hmm. being a citizen, but also what TV and film could do, better storytelling. I say to this day that we wouldn't have had so many killings of black men if we told a better story about black mm -hmm. people mm -hmm. and black men in particular, they wouldn't be seen as the monsters. And I think that that police officer who put his neck on George Floyd's, um, put his knee on his neck, knew that he could do that because he had seen story after story about white men who had done worse yeah. in broad yeah. daylight and had n not suffered any consequences or repercussions. And it was a different day for him. And thank goodness that that young black girl held that camera steady and recorded it. Mm -hmm. But um, we've gone a long way to recognize the power of good storytelling and the power of bad storytelling. So um, that's that's how I got into it. Um, in, inside of politics is a space where you can change legislation, you can change laws to help people. But I'm in the first, I think I'm in the, mar the Marines. The Marines is storytelling. The Marines is what you do. The Marines is how we, how we di digest media, news, those types of things. If those things are corrupt or held by a few, like say white males, then you're gonna get their point of view all the time. And it's mm -hmm. gonna go through their filter. If we start expanding who tells those stories and how we see those stories, the world changes. So it yeah. was a natural sort of building out and Color Farm Media is that expression of me trying to have a larger conversation with what I know to do, which is to tell stories. And how do you think the landscape has changed and continues to change in regards to the way we're able to tell stories on screen? Because I think, I think you know, TV and film and then like what I do as a journalist also kind of intersect because more recently, you know, before we were always told in J school, you know, both sides, this sort of thing. And then like the more as time goes on, especially we've seen over the past four or five years, it was impossible to do that with certain things that happened um, in current events, the last presidency, um, things mm -hmm. like that. And I think that TV and film has kind of done the same thing. It's like you have to show exactly what's going on because this type of stuff literally influences what's what was actually happening too. You know, if you don't if you don't see that depicted in television and film, then you know that's that's what people look to for as far as like influence and inspiration. And I think that there's kind of like a two way street as far as like all forms of media and how we're looking at that differently. So as a storyteller. Do you think that's got, you know, easier as time goes on or harder as time goes on to, you know, essentially give truth to power? Uh, it's never been easy. It won't ever be easy. Um, I believe that it is what it is, that power will try to control the narrative. Mm -hmm. It must control the narrative. If you see how Hitler rose to power, he told an amazing story to people who wanted to hear it. And they created the narrative and they created the the conditions for the narrative to flourish and even created a demon, a villain, and the Jewish people caught, the, caught hell for it. Um, and he was able to, to take that sort of anger from World War I and their defeatism and their, um, their, uh, their lack of self-esteem from having got their, you know, asses handed to them in there mm -hmm. to build themselves up and start new wars. This is this is amazing that they were able to do that in such a short of time. This is in between that world that world war was not only the big plague of 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 the Spanish um, um, flu or whatever that was, you know, the the the, the virus, mm -hmm. but also um, the depression. <laughs> it was all sorts of things, and they turned it into a narrative of like we deserve to rule the world, and so let's go. And that's you have that, that authoritarian voice coming in. And so um, I guess to your question, which, um, um, what was your question? <laughs> <laughs> I, got I was a little going bit. somewhere with all that. I was going on somewhere with that thread. As, as, far, that? as far as the, the landscape as, of, of storytelling, you know, yeah. as time goes on and you're having to, we're having to use um, art as activism, per se. I'm adding that to the question too. Art is okay, activism. Okay. Um, has that gotten easier oh, as time power. goes on as hard? Yes. Yes, and I said that it's always been hard and will be hard. But here's the thing. Um, 
if you look at the things that have, I guess, survived through the through the years, it would be the pe- the things that people wrote down, mm-hmm. the ideas that people wrote down from the biggest philosophers. And African Americans, I should say Africans, have been cut out of that for a very long time. So we have Confucius, we have Socrates, we have these types of people having those conversations, uh, the Buddha and all that. But it survived. Yeah. Even look yeah. at Jesus Christ. I mean, look at look at the the Jewish tradition of the story of the Bible and Muhammad and mm-hmm. those types of things. So if you're thinking about the narratives that survive, the th- and that people build and we build our consciousness on and our even our civilizations, um, those were people who were usually dealing with progressive ideas and telling truth power truth to power. Yeah. Um, here's a big truth about black people that we're not all um, broke down and um, you know and enslaved or enslaved. The 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 place that I think was that best told that story recently was, of course, Black Panther. Black Panther told <laughs> the story of a Wakandan society, um, although fictitious, fictitious, that existed because it was walled off by a big force field and was not being able to be infiltrated by the European colonialism. And they called them colonizers and all that yeah. other stuff. <laughs> and people flocked to that narrative because not only was it instructive, it was destructive of the type of thing that we had in our head all these years. We didn't want to think of ourselves as just slaves. We'd always been told we were came from kings and queens. Well, here's this narrative, and it's you know held beautifully by Chadwick Boseman and the people who made that film. And um, obviously, it came from two Jewish men, uh, Jack King Kirby and Stan Lee. Mm-hmm. They created that world um, years ago, and then here it is expressed by Marvel many years afterwards when black people had enough power to actually hold a Marvel movie space and do it upright. But the reason why that's there and Black Panther Wakanda needed to exist, it was considered the most advanced society in the world. And because of its dedication to science and nature and culture and community, it had to lock itself out from the other world in order to maintain integrity. And even in a world of storytellers and and make-believe, we did not believe that a pristine existence was achievable without eliminating access for most people into that world. And so that's a real morbid fact if you think about it, mm-hmm. <laughs> that they had to yeah. wall it off. But the truth is, that's how we could even buy into it that it had not been corrupted by European colonizations or other worlds. And and in the story of that beautiful story is very simple. Am I my brother's keeper? He goes and finds a cousin that's left behind, and um, by Killmonger, as played uh, and as played by Michael B. Jordan, who comes in and says, "You left me behind, mm-hmm. and I am angry, <laughs> and I am your. I'm a takeover. Hey, Auntie, you know <laughs> he came over to, to burn it down, and we got to ask ourselves, you know, if you're in a better place." Are you your brother's keeper? Do you have some responsibility to go back? So I love those conversations, speaking truth to power in different ways. Truth to power is rebranding blackness. That's Color Farm Media. That's our thing. We call ourselves the film, the the Motown of film, television, and tech. And we want to rebrand blackness. If they branded us a nigger, and there's plenty of black people who took that nigger um, narrative forward, I say I brand us differently. And how how do we do it? By constantly attacking those types of not only stereotypes, but well-worn um, now characterizations of what it is to be black. Yeah, yeah, and, you know, I think I think that's something that we're lucky to be living in a time. I think it's I think it's sort of like a, a renaissance for black creatives now. We have so many different and new and fresh stories that are coming out of this time period we're in. Like you know, it was it was a rough bit of time, but I think it, it allowed allowed us to like you know reset, and that's why I think some of the, the things that we're laying the groundwork and foundation for now, we're going to see the benefits of that for years and years to come because the way we move in Hollywood, the way we tell stories has fundamentally changed than it was, you know, years ago. And I think it'll continue to, um, hopefully, I would say so. Um, but I also want to touch base on Concrete Park um, because, you know, that you have these NFTs, which, you know, I knew NFTs 
I knew vaguely, I knew what they were, kind of. But, you know, we spoke to you, I think, a few months back um, when the launch first happened. And that was the most I had learned (laughs) about (laughs) NFTs from just the general knowledge that I knew. So I would love to just to kind of like explain to us the, the innovation that's there and like why NFTs are the next big thing. Sure. So I'll tell you a little bit about Concrete Park. Concrete Park's a graphic novel that we created, me and my um, creative partner, Tony Perrier. And we wanted to create a science fiction series, film, and or series. And we got a lot of pushback when we went out in the mid-2000s. And uh, we got a, a, a meeting with a film studio president who told us that Black people didn't like science fiction because fiction because they couldn't see themselves in the future, which was absurd. And we pushed back on that. There's a famous story of us telling him that um, for black people, the past is painful, the present precarious, but the future is free. We always create the future. We were the future. He's living in our futuristic Mm -hmm. world. He's living in the world of jazz and hip hop and rock and roll and the blues because African-Americans uniquely were cut off from not only their names, but their culture. So we remade ourselves and that is, the strength of not only the uh, foundation of what American culture is, it's what we export the most is African American culture. And the fact that he didn't know that was ridiculous, but also at the time, um, Will Smith was the number one African American. um, (laughs) And and not just that, number one uh, science fiction star of the world. Mm -hmm. So it was just absurd. And the face of it, no, he hadn't heard of Octavia Butler or uh, Samuel Delaney and those types. Um, NFTs is a natural break, you know, I guess, um, advancement of those kinds of conversations that we've had to have, because even though we did not do it as a, a series or a TV show, we did it as a comic book. Tony, who had never drawn in his life, said, oh, <laughs> F it, I'll draw it. And he drew some panels. He sent it to Mike Richardson of Dark Horse, who, and they do Hellboy, Sin City, the 300, he said, took one look and said, I'd like to publish this. We, within a few months, had our first comic. And within a few months after that, we're, we were chosen as one of America's best um, comics, best American comics. And then um, Forbes said we were one of the best graphic novels in America. Um, that. And that's going around the mountain. And you know what I mean? And find, trying to find a new path. And that's what not only black people, but marginalized people have had to do their whole lives. It's sort of reshape, transform, transformer more than me, <laughs> yeah, you know, and, and become something totally new to, to make our point. NFTs, and I'm gonna explain what they are, because uh, a lot of people in the dark about them, and I had to, to, to learn about them, but they are really, this is a really great, for us, for us it's about engagement. Um, we, we're, we do, we, we're not just a do-it-yourself, we, you know, we do it ourselves in our creative approach. Our business model has been do it yourself. Uh, we're always looking for new ways to engage with our fans. We're science fiction series, we're about the future. And early on we saw NFTs as the future of getting cool concrete park collectibles into the hands of our fans. Mm-hmm. We met with the folks at Curio. They do an amazing job of not only doing NFTs, which is nice and I'll explain what those are, but also attaching storytelling onto them. Nothing to me is worth it without having a story that's connected and they worked with us to create a great program of collectible items and time drops. And so now we even say collect the future, which is what we're about. But NFTs are unique uh, digital collectible. You invest in or you trade and I compare them to like limited edition art prints, each numbered or signed. So in each NFT has a unique digital fingerprint. That's because of the new way that we can now encrypt things and they're prized because they're rare. You're buying into something directly from an artist you like And when someone buys the last one, that's it for the edition. It'll never be offered again. So they're special, they're valuable. And Mm -hmm. there's a robust secondary market for the collectibles. So fans buy, they sell, they trade them. And we see this as an exciting and innovative way to spread news about our story world. But each generation of art goes, undergoes a transformation. So this is our transformation into the world of digital art. And for people who maybe don't understand it, the impressionist or the cubist or the surrealist, Um, they challenge representational art um, because people had um, photography and they were like, well, what do we do? We were painting pictures of people like John Lewis, like we paint his picture, what do we do? 
Well, they started saying, well, what is art? They started, and that's why you got the, the cubists and the surrealists sort of taking the eye and putting it there and putting the mouth over there. Mm-hmm, they mm-hmm. were just trying to be, um, they were trying to find a way to be, um, to, to, to resonate in a, in a challenge, challenging market. But digital art and its creators are ascending and their presence challenges the status quo. So, you know, we're going with that. And so Curios, Curios, I should say, that's our partner. Their NFTs are the missing link. And mm-hmm. so the future has arrived. And, <laughs> and I say it's on a pixel and, and yeah. it's here to stay. Here's the best part about it, Trey. If you were Basquiat back in the day and you sold a painting, say you sold it and he was like, oh, I'm so happy it's over $10,000. Now Basquiat is worth millions of dollars. He doesn't get that money. He don't get a piece of it. Yeah, yeah. But if you sell an NFT, a collectible or a, you know, a collectible piece of art um, that they've bought on that market, whether it's with cryptocurrency, ours you can buy with just a regular credit card. When it goes to secondary market because of the encryption, you are always a part of that chain. You get the money from it. Mm Mm-hmm. That's huge. Yeah, yeah. And it, I mean, it, it, it puts more power back in the creative's hands. <laughs> you have exactly said it. And people like now, even Beyonce and, and music people, it's huge. Because now they can put out an album without having the distributor, the middleman. They can mm-hmm. literally just could put it out, say, I'm going to put out, sure, it can be on Spotify, but this unique version of my album, I'm going to make two million of them. You buy one of them and go straight to their their market straight to their audience you get it you know Beyonce is giving it to you you're the second person if you sell it again third fourth but it's always got a link and a stream that gives those payments Mm -hmm. to Mm -hmm. the original person wow and it's a ledger that's huge so I think people should embrace (laughs) NFTs and encryption and those types of things anything that can bring the artist not only more power but um, um, financial stability yeah. That's huge. And so we're excited about our Curio um, collection. And frankly, we're getting ready to come out with something that's going to be even bigger. We'll be the first yes. comic book to do it. It's a licensed thing. It's going to be it's going to be huge. And it's come out in September. So we're excited about it. This week's Black Entertainment Trivia Fact. Which of these Black entertainers did not guest star on Living Single? Gladys Knight, Monica, Eddie Murphy, or Eartha Kid. Find out the answer next week on shadowandact.com. And I want to shift gears to um, your acting because you're still booked and busy as ever from Black Lightning to Run the World to Wu-Tang, an American saga. In general, what do you think is the key to longevity in this business? I think the key to longevity in film and television and entertainment business is your power to learn Mm -hmm. and grow and adapt. Um, It's very difficult to maintain a focused mental game and you need it. It's very important. Um, It's hard to remain financially stable. Um, There's so many things that are variables um, Mm -hmm. and that you don't control. Um, and then it's very hard to be relevant. Um, how do you maintain relevancy is that you grow. You're not afraid to age. I'm not afraid to age. I'm going to age. It's nice when people give me a really beautiful con- compliment and say black don't crack, but it does crack. <laughs> no, it, <laughs> it does crack, not. Like, it cracked <laughs> out. It cracked because you know what it is? It's not necessarily in looks, but it's in, um, it's in spirit. You get angry, you get jaded, and you realize that one of the things that makes you an artist is your ability to to be surprised, to be yeah. naive, to grow, to be, oh, wow, to be thrilled. And if you're over it and sort of just like, yeah, it is what it is, and I'm going to do this, and you're, you know, or you have some sort of conversation with yourself that, you know, I should be getting this, and I have it, and I'm like, you may be right about all those things, but you got to get yourself up again to sh- to open yourself up to the possibility that today you can be surprised and grow and um, and renew yourself 
with your partners that are with you um, on set, with your with producers who might have neglected to give you your props before. You have to find some way to forgive them and say, I'm getting my opportunity now. Let me go in there and do the best I can. Um, and it's, it's tough. So that's how. I think that that's the most important part. And you have to continue to be self-taught and grow. You've got to read. Uh, the best actors I know are very smart. Um, they may not be um, in, in particular. <laughs> they can say silly <laughs> things, but they're some of the smartest people I know. They're big. They're the big. They have huge amounts of empathy and compassion. And um, that's tough too because it can be easy to lay in the cut. You're so exhausted sometimes doing the thing that you don't come back and read or or take it, pay attention to current events or pay attention to what's going on around you. And you need to, you need to find some way to organize your thoughts, to sit down and have a simple conversation with you and another person through reading and taking it in in that way Mm -hmm. and not just listening and sort of like a voyeur watching. We make entertainment for people to look at us and to look at, but we should be always organizing ourselves around the creation of words, the creation of books and stories, the creation of narration, the creation of theater, the creation of music. How do those things organize themselves? Keep putting yourself in those positions. And I think that you'll be pleased with the types of things that you'll attract to yourself, but also in maintaining balance. Yeah, yeah. And I want to talk about Run the World specifically just because um, you know, it's it's not exactly the same, of course, but like premise wise, you know, it, it bears a lot of similarity to living single. You know, first of all, focusing on a group of friends, but also because Yvette Lee Bowser is also attached to the project. But um, what drew you specifically to be a part of this project? And also, what do you feel in general about the surge and boom of black women led comedies because you know you have run the world you have harlem coming soon on amazon which is from tracy oliver and then i'm sure there's more and then i think that insecure is probably the main one to like at least lead the charge of you know black women leading comedies again so a run the world in that role but also how do you feel about black women leading comedies again on screen because it's it's been a long time we i'm glad that there is space for there's going there's going to be space for so many of them to thrive in this current environment of television we're in trey it's about time (laughs) that's all i that is the real main thing that i can say about black led female comedies we have over performed Mm -hmm. in comedy in terms of success and we have been underrepresented in the types of of stories and series that were being made that is down to misogyny racism and foolishness because that's not even about the bottom line the bottom line shows that we were always translating very well and um, making money Mm -hmm. and um, making history. But something stopped it. And it's unacceptable that it's taken this long for say an Issa Rae or any of these people to have made a headway into those spaces. It should have gone on and on and on. We look at different world, look at, you know, living single, those types of things. Absolutely. Um, I always looked at some of our predecessors who were so magnificently did great portrayals. Felicia Rashad, why didn't she have a whole show? You tell me. Mm -hmm. Uh, Patricia Heaton has six, I think, Emmys for Best Actor. Felicia Rashad, none. Nothing. That doesn't make sense. Still, you know, so I I came across this stat because um, Marla Gibbs is going to play Jack A's um, mother on Days of Our Lives um, soon. And I came across the stat that Jack A is still the only black woman to win the outstanding supporting actress in a comedy series emmy still to this day and i and i and and it's and it's and it's it's so hard because like you you know that is the space that black women dominate so when it's not reflected in the accolades but it's also just it hasn't been reflected in a time where we've seen again there's going to be at least at least three shows that we know that are comedy series led by black women on tv 
at the same time and you know it's, it's, it's a shame that it's just it's taken us this long you know yeah it's more than a shame it's and it's a it's a it's a it's a tragic comedy <laughs> <laughs> it's awful there's nothing else to be said about it except for if the correction has come and there's these new shows harlem run the world all these things then good on them you know um i was asked by yvette lee bowser and the co-creator and um um the person that it's based on lee davenport's life uh to do a role on it barb ballard they said you know this role is made for you eric you can <laughs> come and and do it we'd be so happy and thrilled if you did and um i was glad i said yes it was great to work with yvette lee bowser again we hadn't worked in all these years together she had gone on to do, have great success with blackish and um you know um all these other shows and um we had not worked together before and he, they did a great job. I think Run the World is fantastic. It's It follows the group of very smart, vibrant, 30-something black women in Harlem. They're fiercely loyal friends. That's what Yvette Lee Bowser is known for. They live, they work, and they play in Harlem. And they strive for world domination. They say, we're going to run the world. And by the way, they're navigating their careers, high and lows. They're obviously inside of relationships. They're hooking up. They're getting their heart broken and those types of things but they're enviable relationships and friendships. And that's what Yvette Lee is known for, creating enviable female relationships. And the, the, they cast really wonderfully. I'm really glad to see the young cast um, um, and be a part of it. Uh, and I just showed up, you know, I, I, I saw it as an opportunity for myself ultimately to reassert myself with a younger generation. Mm -hmm. But also, you know, if you're in a relay race, you pass the baton and you, those people take off and you go, Phew, and you go like this a little bit. <laughs> I'm still running behind them. Don't get, don't get me wrong. You know what I mean? I still, I, you, all, the, all the smoke is still there. You hear me? Mm -hmm. But, um, you know, you, you're glad to see them, them move forward and you wish them well. And, and that's how you do it. Um, there's no ever any bad feelings for the things that are out there, my feelings are more directed in a way of, there's many people who did not get their shot mm -hmm. and deserved more of a chance. I talk about a lot about how after living single, no one asked me to, to create or be in anything. Um, and you all were literally the blueprint, literally the blueprint. <laughs> we know, we oh, we all know that. I'm so glad that there's a lot of there's been a lot of discourse, especially over like the past few years, um, because so many people are just rediscovering other shows via streaming, and it's like you know we've been there, we've done that. You know, at the time, not a lot of people may have peeped it, but we peep it now. <laughs> we peep it now. Yeah, you know, and, and, and again, I, for your generation and the generation that's coming along, you need to see that these things are not promised. You know, uh, voting rights, oh, we have that straight, no problem. No, they're gonna take them away. Yeah. Roe versus Wade. Oh, we have the right to determine our own body. No, they could take that away. People think that these are people being sort of, you know, alarmists and these types of things, they're not. So of course they're doing it inside of film and television. There's no reason why, if you've ruled things for hundreds of years, you wanna give that up easily. But the truth is, it's never been a minority market, black people and brown people, whatever. We're the majority market, we're ascendant. Mm -hmm. We are now saying, and they are seeing, that they cannot get them in those theater seats. And they cannot get them to pay attention on their streaming platforms unless they show them stuff that looks like them. Yeah. And for a very long time, Black, brown, and white people have said they wanted to see a world that better translated into the world they lived in, which was not a main sort of source of white male superiority, which is what we got. And there were great shows inside of all of that. I'm not trying to take that away. There were really wonderful things that happened, but not enough. Yeah. And we're still battling that. So I give all props. I wish Harlem well. I, I, I know all of these young women that are in these spaces. I know many of the showrunners. And all I can say is, you know, boy, boy, fucking Yaj. Yes, yes, absolutely, absolutely. And 
I can't talk with you without asking about Living Single because you took you took over our Facebook page last year when we were in the thick of quarantine and fans asked you about this. Kim Fields did the same thing. She took over and fans always asked about this. So I'm going to ask you again, um, whether it be a revival, whether it be a reboot, whether it be just like some sort of reunion type thing would you be interested in one would, we, would you be interested in revisiting and two um what would you what would you even think that would look like now well Trey, i've always been the person who said that once you've done something and really done it and you hopefully feel like you've done it well why do it over again mm -hmm. it would be great to have a reunion with these actors and these um people that i love and do something interesting and modern right now and yeah. iterate on that you know um i'm a person that says why don't you we do a mashup you know <laughs> you, you, you take the you take the cast you shake them up and see what else they can do together you mm -hmm. know and and surprise people because no matter what we do we let people down we let people down with you know as was difference in looks you know the difference in energy i'm i'm nearly 30 years older I'm 30 years more tired. I'm 30 years more smart, more wise. I'm 30 years more energetic inside of a different type of space. And that 23, 24 year old um, has changed. So I would love to see that. Um, I saw them do a really great job of Will and, Will and Grace and them mm -hmm. doing it, but they did it much closer to when they ended it, you know, number one. Right. And so I think, I don't know what it would look like. I think it would be great. Um, is a puppet show. Really. <laughs> I, would, I would love that. You know that that would be hysterical, and we all have yes. the same voices. So I'm, yeah. you know, I could be, you know. <laughs> yeah. I mean, hey, hey, hey. what's going on, Kyle? Be. Well, you know, like, well, like puppets. Well, you know, just this whole animated thing is like the craze now, anyway. So like, I could, I could, I could low key see that. You know, as as we've seen now, like IP is king. What is old is new again. Everyone is coming up with some sort of way to bank on nostalgia because nostalgia is king. Everyone wants to feel those same um, emotions, even though like you have people who necessarily weren't um weren't you know they were probably babies at the time when living seal came on but they have tv one and they've seen the reruns they have the streaming services so everyone knows about these shows we, we live in we live in a time now where i always say that um like everyone wants to feel like we did like people did in the 90s and the early 2000s that's that's why when those shows dropped on netflix the um the six or seven um black comedies from the late 90s 2000 everyone was like yes and then you're like okay let's do this again but you know it's also kind of bridging the gap between you know nostalgia like in having that good nostalgia but also making sure that they're it's fresh too and fresh voices and fresh people and that's and that's why i think you know you have you know retreats of things which are good but you also have new works that are coming out at the same time they're also as good and they can like coexist and meet up and we all just have all this fresh black content you know no absolutely it's the rebrowning of america it has come and it's a change of the guard. And that may sound threatening to some, uh, but we know historically that's how great societies thrive. And I look in my rear view mirror and I know that things may be closer than they appear. <laughs> 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 but I also know how far back that mirror can see. Mm -hmm. And um, we, we need to be out front in, in, inside of that. And so, I'm looking forward to what the new guard brings in. And I know I'm part of that new guard because I'm in a different package. I'm, I'm an actress who is a producer and a director mm -hmm. and doing the reparations documentary and podcast and doing the, um, you know, a new podcast with Charlemagne and, and Kevin Hart's called Finding Tamika, those types of things. Mm -hmm. I'm excited about it. I'm excited about having those conversations because when I come in a room with a young man like you, Trey, you trust me to sort of use my power to say, hey, this is what I think creatively can go on, but you're also trusting me to use my power to say, what do you think, Trey? And invite you into the space. Why? Because I understand that you're no new Jack either. You've been here, you help bring the um, conditions for success and we can do it together. Mm -hmm. Like to me, that's, that's then that becomes a power play. You know what I mean? Yeah, Where your yeah. youth and exuberance and and, and, you know, mixed with experience and, you know, and leveraging 
that forward becomes all the ammunition you need. And frankly, that's the best thing about being inside of film and television. I mean, if we looked at John Lewis's superhero origin story, which I love to talk about, there he was, a son of sharecroppers. He's preaching to the chickens. He writes Martin Luther King Jr., dubs him the boy from Troy. He studies nonviolence with Reverend Lawson, who I love, and is still teaching nonviolence. He becomes a student activist with SNCC. He travels through the Jim Crow South. He has a freedom rider. He gets his ass whooped. He recovers. He returns. He <laughs> marches <laughs> forward. He goes to D.C. And here we are with a real live superhero named John Lewis yeah. in our lifetime who we got to see grow old those people they killed yeah absolutely that's that's why it was so you know when 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 he passed that's why it was so killing because they you they tried to they tried to date a lot of what happened so much like you know this is someone who is who was a politician now and then he experienced it then that's why I, the this this past um a few weeks ago when um Emmett Till, the anniversary of Emmett Till's um, yeah. passing, yeah. Th- that was the first time that I had saw a color photograph of Ooh. him and his mother. That was the first yeah. time. And like mm-hmm. we, we still have people, we're seeing all these pictures of MLK that we've only seen in black, white, and they're in color now. And that, that just, it makes, it, it hits home the point that like, no, this is, this is, this is not as far back as, as they may try to make it seem. And I think that was, that was definitely something that John Lewis showed <laughs> us because he was so heavily involved in so much of that stuff and was still in, involved so much right up until he passed too. Right up until when he passed. And I think that that's the example we need to take. Which, as we look to Marvel and DC to create superheroes, we have tons of our own. And we need to turn that camera, not away from Martin Luther King and those people, but move it aside so we can see who was there. Fannie Lou Hamer, Ida B. Wells, who, mm-hmm. who, who, did, who, who were their heroes? They're still here. And we need to tell those stories. We need to meet those people. We need to give them their flowers, but we also need to get the blueprint. We have got to get the blueprint. We mm-hmm. need to bring it home. We can't let people like Prince and Michael Jackson and Whitney Houston pass away and take the blueprint. We need to speak to them now. They have the breadcrumbs and we need to speak to them now. And that's why I appreciate this conversation because as I go along, who knows, you know, tomorrow could be my last breath, but Trey would say, oh, I spoke to her. And this is what she was trying to build. These are the types of things she was trying to convey. This was her, you know, her, um, her uh, her goal and her mission, and here's the people she was trying to do it with, and these are the. T- I mean, I just would like more and more of that, not to be owned by Getty, to be owned by you, to be owned by people <laughs> yes. who will get it to the right people, you know, and and so therefore this is an important conversation that needs to happen over and over again. You are important in the cycle and in also the vi- the the vine that feeds the roots, and we know that with black and brown stories. Um, we haven't always been nurtured or gotten the proper nutrition, but we will now because of you, because of Shadow and Act, because we're having these conversations. We talked to Erica Alexander about everything from activist art to NFTs to Concrete Park to even what living single may look like if it were to ever return. Thank you for listening to this week's episode of Opening Act with Erica Alexander. Don't forget to leave us a five-star rating and a review wherever you download your podcasts. You can watch this interview in full, as well as catch exclusive content on lunchtable.com. All you have to do is create an account, and you'll see all sorts of Shadow Act content, such as Reel the Back and Shadow Act Live. Until next time.